Could we turn to the Gospel of John? John chapter 3, please. John chapter 3. We're breaking into this account here at verse number 14. Sorry, verse number 11. Sorry, verse number 11 of John chapter 3. Of course, this is a familiar passage uh, that we're, we're looking at. The early part of John chapter 3, of course, deals with Nicodemus and this great ruler who came to Jesus for answers. The man who came by night, as is often recorded in many children's meetings. But I want us to turn here to John chapter 3, and we're breaking into this passage at verse number 11. The scriptures tell us, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting or have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in God. Finishing our reading there at verse number 21. Let's bow together in a moment of prayer, please. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for everything that has taken place thus far. Lord, we're thankful for the lovely hymns and courses that we've been singing together, that we can point to that day and hour that we can say that my anchor is built on the solid rock, that I have an anchor that's steadfast and sure, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for Deborah and the pieces that she was singing. Lord, that you lead us once again to the cross this evening. Lord, that men and women will, in this place, and even as they listen perhaps later on the internet, Lord, we pray that they will answer that question that she was singing about in the second piece, that how can you say no to this man, the one who gave up his life for us? Lord, we pray now as we turn to this passage together. Lord, I ask for your help once again. Lord, I ask that you come uh, mightily upon me this evening, I pray. Hide me behind the cross, I ask. Lord, I pray that none be seen save Jesus only. I ask for an infilling of the Spirit once again, Lord, we pray. And Lord, I pray that you take the words and you direct them to hearts and to souls this very evening, we ask. For we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 If I was to ask you this evening what you thought was an important aspect of the gospel message, how would you answer? How would you answer it? Because there's so many to consider. There's so many different aspects of the gospel message for us to consider and for us to think upon. If we were to take just one aspect every night, and, and preached upon it, and then the following night preached upon the next aspect, surely this mission could run for many, many weeks. We could speak of the cross, and Stephen started off with the cross last night, and we thought about the thieves as they hung on the cross there beside Jesus Christ. We could talk about the blood that flowed down the cross that day, the blood that still cleanses the sin of men and women across our land and across our country and across the world worldwide tonight. We could speak of the offer of salvation. We could speak of the need of repentance. And indeed, they're all great aspects of what I want us to consider and what you must act upon this side of eternity. But you know, this evening, I want us to think on just one word this evening, one word that we find in this passage. I've entitled it, The Call to the Whosoever. 
The call to the whosoever. We find it there in verses 14 to 16. Read it again with me. There are verses perhaps we all know and verses perhaps we have all heard quoted and preached on many, many times. But don't allow that to affect our concentration this evening. Read them again. It says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It goes on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, when God says once in the Scriptures, it's important. When he takes time to say it twice inside a couple of verses, we need to understand what he's saying. Here twice he's saying that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's the first whosoever that we can consider. And here we see John tells us a story in the Old Testament. We read that story back in the Old Testament when the, the deadly serpents entered the Israelite camp. The only cure that we find there was to look to the brazen serpent that God told Moses to make and to raise that high in the midst of the camp. And everyone that would gaze upon that serpent would be healed. John tells us here that whosoever was to look, it was for the atonement, that whosoever had to make their own decision. And it's the exact same as we sit in our gospel meeting night after night. You see, the atonement is there. The sacrifice has been made. And it's up to the whosoever to gaze upon the sacrifice. It's up to the whosoever to act upon the sacrifice. It's up to the whosoever to make that decision for themselves. I can't do it for you. Stephen can't. Bertie can't. None of us can do it for you. It's up to the whosoever. The exact same in the Israelite camp. It was the whosoever who had to gaze. And that's what I want us to take a few thoughts on. Based on that title, the call of the whosoever. You see, the gospel message again goes out to the whosoever through the cross of Calvary. The great story, the great message of the cross that we heard Stephen preaching on last night. You see, the cross of Calvary is what I point to this evening. And it's because of the cross of Calvary to why I stand in this pulpit tonight. Friends, I'm nothing. I deserve nothing. I can do nothing. But you see, one day I looked to the cross. One day I realized I was the whosoever. One day I realized I needed to look to the cross for myself and I answered the call of the gospel. I realized I was the whosoever. And friends, so must you. So must you. Or sadly, you end up in a lost eternity. Blunt, yes. True, absolutely. The hymn writer could say, Oh, what wonderful love. Oh, what grace divine that Jesus should die for me. I was lost in sin for the world I pined, but now I am set free. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Just as the whosoever had to look to that brazen serpent, then you, the whosoever this evening, you must look to the cross which Jesus Christ died upon. You see, understand like those in the Israelite camp, there was no other hope. There was no other hope in the Israelite camp. You see, those serpents made their way in and those serpents attacked and there was no cure. There was no cure until Moses raised that brazen serpent and men and women had to gaze upon that serpent as it sat in the midst of the camp. Let's trace the call of the gospel to the whosoever throughout the New Testament because there's many whosoevers and I want us to consider just a few of them this evening. The first call of the whosoever, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. We're going to call that the call of invitation. The call of invitation. Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. Acts 13 and 26. <clears throat> 
Here we read, it says, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. You know, following on from what Stephen was talking about last night, can I ask you, do you fear God? Do you fear God this evening? Even Christian alike, do we fear God? Do we have that reverential fear and respect for God? Unsaved soul this evening, do you fear God? But if you die in your sin and you stand face to face with Jesus Christ, your sin hasn't been dealt with, do you fear God? Now think upon it and think about what we're, what we're talking about tonight. Because we're not just coming into a service here for an hour. We're not just coming here to spend an hour. We're not just fulfilling an obligation to a friend or a family member perhaps that you promised that you would come to. Because this evening you're coming before the God of heaven. You're coming into the midst of his presence this evening. The one who spoke and the world came into existence. The one who sent his only begotten son that we read here in John chapter 3. And tonight he speaks directly to that soul of yours. Perhaps he's called in the past. Perhaps in previous meetings he's been calling that soul of yours. Perhaps he's been telling you about your need of salvation. Friends, that's God stirring the heart. That's God starting to stir the heart. Maybe you're wondering tonight why you're, you're feeling so uncomfortable in gospel meetings. Maybe you're, you're, you feel uncomfortable sitting in the pew when the gospel message is starting to be preached and the appeal is starting to be made. Friends, don't, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't push it to the side. Don't leave it to another night. The verse said, Whosoever, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. You know, the word of this salvation has been sent here to the Grange Corner. And perhaps for some soul in our gathering this evening, this mission has been sent just for you. Maybe this mission has been sent just for you. Every tract, every invitation that has went out, Stephen was saying the best part of 2,000 tracts have went out, but maybe it was just for you. And maybe this, the, the salvation, the offer of salvation, the word of this salvation, as Acts chapter 13 tells us, maybe it's been sent for that soul of yours. Maybe God's moving in your life tonight. Again, don't push it to the side. Don't push it to one side. Again, you're not here just to pass this night. Because before you leave this place tonight, before you press stop, on the recording on the internet. You'll make a decision. You'll make a decision about what you will do with Jesus Christ. You'll either accept him or you'll walk out of this meeting and you'll reject him. Like the thief on the cross from last night. What will you do? You know, the call of invitation rings out. The hymn writer could say time after time he has waited before and now, now he's waiting again. To see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. The call of invitation. Turn over with me now to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 43. Acts chapter 10 and 43. You see, the first call was the call of invitation. The second call is the call of promise. The call of promise. Acts 10 and verse 43. It says, to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. I love this verse. What a great verse this is. It's a verse of victory for every sinner that comes to Jesus Christ. Let's read it with victory again. It says that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, might receive, and shall receive. 
shall receive remission of sins through his name. See, friends, this evening at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus. One day you will bow the knee. One day the biggest atheist in the country, one day the biggest hypocrite in the world will bow the knee. Friends, I urge you to do it this night when he calls that soul of yours in mercy. Friends, I ask you to bow the knee tonight because tonight we're born in sin. We're destined for a lost eternity. Chasms of hell. Not my words. The words of Scripture. Words of Scripture. Not only that call of invitation, it's the call of promise. The call of promise to that soul of yours. Friends, if you have heard the call of invitation to that soul of yours, you can rely on this call. You can rely on this call of promise. It says that through his name, whosoever, that's you. That's you, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. You can leave here changed tonight. Leave here forgiven. Leave here with the judgment removed. Ye shall receive remission of sins. What a powerful word that word remission is. Almighty word. Leaving here with remission of sins. Have you ever looked up the translation of what remission actually means? You see, remission can be translated as being released from prison or released from bondage. That's the translation of the word we're dealing with here. Christian, smile at me. What a great word that is. Ye shall receive remission of sins. Those chains that are holding you bound in sin this evening, sinner friend, they can be broken to pieces. Broken to pieces. The sins that's holding you tight in your sinful life, dragging you blindfolded to a lost eternity, smashed in pieces. How do I know it? How can I be sure? Friends, believe on the whosoever of promise. Believe in the promise, verse number 43, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. There's no ifs here. You can believe on him in this meeting. Sinner friend this evening, bow your head where you're at. Bow your head where you're at. Talk to God where you're at. Cry unto him in repentance. A belief that comes from the heart. A belief that in childlike faith says, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. Come into my life. Change my life from this day forward. You have promised. You have promised. In the early morning prayer meetings, we've been looking at that little phrase, hold God to his word. Say, God, you've promised this. You've promised that whosoever, you've promised that if I come to you, that you will give me remission of sins, that you'll break the bonds, that you'll break the chains, and I'll leave here changed. But you know, the definition of remission doesn't end there. Remission can also mean forgiveness of sins as if they've never been committed. As if they've never been committed. What a saviour. What a saviour we have this evening. Not only takes our sins, but never more will they be held against us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That we stand forgiven, washed clean, as if they'd never been, forg- for, uh, they'd never been committed. The hymn writer could say, faultless I stand before the throne. How do I know? How can I be sure? What did verse number 43 tell us? It says that through his name, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Those old chains that be broken, the sins never more to be held against us anymore. Friends, we're talking about an awesome Savior tonight. We're talking about a Savior who's calling you, giving you that invitation tonight, giving you that promise.
the call of invitation, the call of promise. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse number 21 this time. Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. You see, we had the call of invitation. We had the call of promise. Now we have the call of opportunity. The call of opportunity. Acts 2 and 21 says, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the call that's extended to every soul from this platform this evening. To every man or woman, boy or girl. Again, the scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's your opportunity. It's your opportunity. It's why this mission has been brought to this plot of ground. It's why every invitation has gone out. It's why every door has been wrapped and knocked and flyers put through doors. To tell them of the whosoever who can save their souls. You see, the thief on the cross had that same call of opportunity. He had that same opportunity that Stephen looked at last night. As Jesus was in the very midst, one thief on one side, one thief on the other side. You see, those two thieves had the exact same opportunity. They were both the same distance away from Jesus Christ. You see, the first thief looked at himself. He looked at Jesus and he looked for an escape route. He looked for another way just to get down off that cross. Oh, he might have called out to Jesus, but it wasn't from the heart. All he wanted to do was to get down off that cross. Oh, if you're Jesus, come down to that cross and take me with you. What about the other thief? He looked at himself. Oh, he looked at Jesus. But he looked at the call of opportunity. He looked at the call of promise. He looked at the call of invitation that was there in his midst. Friend, will you do the same this evening? Because tonight that call of opportunity is directly offered to you. If I was to offer you a holiday to America or somewhere this evening, all expenses paid, and told you that the opportunity was only there for the next 10 minutes, you'd have a decision to make. A very quick decision, mind you. But you'd have a decision to make. And here we are this evening. And we're dealing with the priceless, unmerited opportunity that is presented to you once again. Presented to souls time and time again. You wouldn't have much decision to make on accepting a prepaid holiday. And yet something of such vast importance is put in the back burner. Something of such vast importance that will deal with this side of eternity and the next side of eternity is dealt with so flippantly and is dealt with so glibly. Men and women don't care. Men and women will always find an excuse not to deal with their eternal, never dying soul. Friend, this is a verse that concerns you. Why? Because of the word whosoever. Because of the whosoever. And this verse tells you everything that you need to do in this meeting this evening. If you're in here and you don't know how to get right with Jesus Christ, then listen to the words here from Acts chapter 2 and 21. It says, The whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're to call out in faith to Jesus this evening in complete earnestness, knowing that he's the only one that's able to save you from your sin. You think of Peter. Think of Peter as he walked on the water. You think of Peter as he, everything was going well. He was making his way along that water. You think of Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul was busy. Paul had many things running through his head or Saul in those days as he was making his way along that Damascus Road. And he had much going through his head. You think of the Philippian jailer. The Philippian jailer was busy with work commitments. Here was a man, he had much going on in his head as well. But you see, all these men came to one point. They realized they needed a touch. They realized they needed help. 
For Peter, it was whenever he started to sink under that water, he cried out, Lord, Lord, save me. As Saul was going down that Damascus road, that bright light shone from heaven, he dropped to his knees, and Saul could say, Who art thou, Lord? What would the Philippian jailer? That mighty earthquake. All the prison doors had swung open. Tells us in the scriptures he drew the sword about to kill himself. He dropped on his knees. He cried out, what must I do to be saved? You see, Peter, Saul, Philippian jailer, they all came to that point where they realized that they needed to call out. That they needed to call upon the Savior. That they needed to lift up their voice. That they had to call personally. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And maybe for you, maybe all's going well in your life. Maybe you're busy with work plans. Maybe you're busy with plans for the future. Maybe you're considering what you're going to do next. What about when God starts to speak to your soul? What about when God starts to, to give that soul of yours that touch? Starts to speak directly to that soul of yours. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when he starts to call you? Let me state it very clearly this evening. In our unsaved state, we have no way of getting to heaven. We have no way of getting to heaven. Scriptures tell us, no man cometh to the Father but by me. By the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood that was shed on Calvary's tree, it's a fact. It's a fact that I've been crying out from the pages of Scripture for many, many years. It's why we have the gospel meeting to tell you of your need, to tell you of your state, to tell you of your eternal hopelessness. But listen and praise God for it. That the call of the gospel is still ringing from this pulpit. That voices will not be silent from this pulpit. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. But not only that condition to the call, there's an assurance to the call because it says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Maybe you think you couldn't be saved. Maybe you think that there must be something more to just calling, to just merely calling out. Listen, the call of opportunity is clear. It's clear. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. That's what makes it possible. That's what makes it dependable. You're not calling upon my name. I'll forget to do something as quick as anybody. We see you're depending on the name of the Lord here. You're not calling upon some celebrity's name. You're not calling on the monarchy's name. You're calling on Jesus Christ. On the name of the Lord. Lord, you see, when we're calling on a mighty God, you see, the believer's salvation is guaranteed by the oath and by the promise of God. The oath and the promise of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Turn with me finally, please. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 15. You see, we had the call of invitation we had the call of promise. We had the call of opportunity. Our final call in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, the call of judgment. The call of judgment. Revelation 20 and 15 says, Whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, this is the danger of the calls that we're dealing with this evening. The danger of the calls that we have been considering. You see, with each call that we have been looking at this evening, there was a hope. There was a promise. There was an assurance that we could have depended upon. But not here. Not here. You see, you might know this evening that there's a call of invitation that goes out to your heart. And you might understand there's a call of promise that goes out to your heart. There's a call of opportunity goes out to your heart. You see, now we're getting to the call of judgment. Now we're getting to the call of judgment. 
And listen to that verse one more time and understand what it means before we leave this place tonight. Because at this stage, the call of invitation has passed. And the call of promise has passed. And the call of opportunity is passed. And the call of judgment is beckoning. It says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I know these are strong words. And if I offend anyone, I apologize, but believe me, here and now, that these are words that need to be said. These are words that need to be understand, understood. You know, I would much rather you hated me on this side of eternity. I'd much rather you despised me for offending you on this side of eternity than for you to realize, for you to realize in a lost eternity, in the chasms of hell, and for you to curse my name. For you to curse my name and say, I was at that mission. That boy never told me. That boy never told me the dangers that lay from rejection. You know what? He hate me, despise me, spit on me, going out through that door. But you know what? You'll not leave this place unwarned. You'll not leave this place unwarned tonight. <coughs> Don't ignore the warning coming from the pages of Scripture. Be forever lost in hell. You see, you're the whosoever that God gave his son for. You're the whosoever that Jesus Christ went through the beatings for. Went through the tortures for. Went through the ridicule for. So that Revelation 20 wouldn't be written about you. You know, we're not here to pass a few nights. Believe me, if I was here to pass a few nights, I'd be lying in front of the fire tonight. We're not here for the sake of it. It's because we understand the seriousness of the whosoever. The seriousness of whenever we get to this call. Oh, we can consider the opportunity. We can consider the promise. We consider the invitation as much as we want. And we can read through those lovely verses with a smile on our face and it warms our heart. Ah, but when we get to the call of judgment, ah, we don't want to put our name into that wee verse anymore. We don't want to drop our name into the whosoever there anymore. When we know that the, the call of, the, of, of judgment is about to fall. Friend, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? What are you refusing to let go of this evening? Is it worldly possessions? Leave them behind. 1 Timothy 6 and 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and a certain will carry nothing out. Is it an addiction or a vice or something you just feel you can't break, you can't get rid of? Isaiah 61 and 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach liberty to the captives. Is it so-called other Christians that are not living as they should and you're watching them and looking at them and that's what's putting you off. Get your eyes off them. They'll answer for themselves. Don't let them take you to a lost eternity. Titus 1 and 16 says they profess that they know God but in their works they deny him. God knows all about them. Sin that has kept you bound for so many years. Oh, it'll seem so trivial on the other side of eternity. It'll seem so trivial when we get to the other side of eternity. You see, the possessions will still be here, but you won't. The addictions of this world that kept you bound in your sin, they'll still be here, but you won't. The old hypocrites, they might still be here, but you won't. No earthly possession will be of any importance when you look face to face with God and you're asked that question what did you do with my son I showed you that you were part of the whosoever I showed you that I died for you and my son died for you I showed you your need of repentance 
Friends, we're dealing with serious words. Because we're dealing with serious matters. Think of the call of the gospel found in John 3 and verse 16 as we draw to a close. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I thank God this evening that we're still in the day of grace. That we're still in the day of grace this evening. That we can still hear the call of invitation to our hearts. That we can still hear the call of promise. Oh, that we can still hear the call of opportunity. Ah, oh, but friends like offers in shops and supermarkets, advising, advertising free this and free that, oh, it's only going to last for a while. And from the scripture quoted often, but it needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Genesis 6 and verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. You know, one day God's going to say, Enough's enough. Enough's enough. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, It's time. It's time to seek the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6 and 2, Behold now. Behold now is the accepted time. Behold now is the day of salvation. Why is it important? Because that call of judgment is a step closer. That call of judgment is 24 hours closer than when Stephen stood in this pulpit last night. Don't let the lies and the snares of the devil hold you back any longer. These meetings are here to warn. They're for you to meet with your Savior. He's here tonight. And he's ready to save. Ready to save. Whosoever, you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come tonight. Speak to us. Take a booklet out of our hands at the door. Read it. Cry out to God where you're at. But don't miss the call of the Savior to that heart of yours. A call to the whosoever goes out one more time. Amen.